Hey, it's Andrew, and today on the show we have Chris Riedekrapp, co-founder and CEO of Sendoso. In this episode, we talked about how Sendoso helps its customers retain and delight their customers, the different ways a sales team can help avoid or decrease churn, and how to make sure you're selling to the right ICP. We also discussed Sendoso's sales strategy when they first got started and how it evolved, their ups and downs when it comes to churn and retention, and the changes they made in order to hit a net dollar retention close to 120% today. As usual, I'm excited to hear what you think of this episode, and if you have any feedback, I would love to hear from you. You can email me directly on andrew at churn.fm. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, and enjoy the episode. Today's episode is sponsored by Avrio, a collaborative insights platform built directly into your workflow. With the browser extension and web app, Avrio provides a new way to capture and share data analysis, user research, and learnings directly in context with your team. From data dashboards, Google Slides, and Slack threads, to inside of apps and team members' heads, Avrio captures all of your insights and creates a single source of truth. Visit avrio.com to learn how you can maximize your team's collective knowledge with Avrio. This is Churn.fm, the podcast for subscription economy pros. Each week, we hear how the world's fastest growing companies are tackling churn and using retention to fuel their growth. How do you build a habit forming product? We crossed over that magic threshold to negative churn. You need to invest in customer success. It always comes down to, to retention and engagement. Completely bootstrap, profitable, and growing. Strategies, tactics, and ideas brought together to help your business thrive in the subscription economy. I'm your host, Andrew Michael, and here's today's episode. Hey, Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. It's great to have you. For the listeners, Chris is the CEO and co-founder of Sendosa, the leading sending platform helping companies stand out by giving them new ways to engage with customers throughout the buyer's journey by integrating digital and physical sending strategies to improve their customer relationships. Prior to Sendoso, Chris started his career out as a founder of All Student Rentals and then set off on a career in sales with roles at Yapstone, Cora, and TalkDesk. So my first question for you, Chris, is did you start the company to help you close more deals? I did. And it was actually started because of a pain point I felt while I was at one of my last companies, TalkDesk where I found myself as an account executive and I was trying to be more creative. So I'd send out handwritten notes. I'd go grab swag from our swag closet or I'd go online to find gifts for prospects. And it worked really well. It was terribly time consuming to manually pack boxes, go to the post office, track links. And so I dreamed up of this idea is like, why isn't there a button in Salesforce that I can just click a button and send something to somebody? That's very cool. And maybe just talk us through that a little bit as well, like what Sendos, how you help customers. And obviously this was one of the use cases, but what is like the general use cases you seeing your customers use the product for? Yeah. So real quick, Sendos is kind of three parts. One part software that really takes this offline gift sending and direct mail sending online. So there's teams, budgets, reporting, integrations, analytics. There's then this marketplace of all the different things you could send. And then there's all the fulfillment. So there's warehousing and fulfillment centers behind the scenes. So all that make it so easy to click a button and send something. And for our customers that are using us in more of a a customer success account management function, we see people sending things for welcoming new clients or new customers. So it's like a welcome kit. Oftentimes that'll come with some kind of collateral and then some kind of welcome swag or some kind of welcome gift. There's also typically there's things that you can send for like graduation from onboarding. So it's celebrating certain milestones while using the product. There's your typical like annual holiday gifts that you might want to send out to your customers. That's probably the most popular one historically is like Christmas and holiday gifts. There's then just like one-off gifts that maybe a CSM would want to send to a customer for maybe uh, your customer just had a baby or maybe they just had a birthday and maybe there's other life events that you want to really build a more human relationship with than just a vendor to customer relationship. And so those are more ad hoc. They're not usually automated or, or triggered. They're just at the discretion of the CSM to send things out when they feel like there's something to be sent to their customer. 
Very cool. And so you gave like from the customer success perspective, quite a few different use cases. And it actually triggered a memory as well from an earlier episode where we had uh, Julian Caban or G or the mad scientist as others like to call him. And I, I remember this quite specifically because I found it really fascinating in the sense of, I can't remember which company it was at, but obviously I know like the company themselves, they had a really high ARPA so they could afford to send elaborate gifts to their customers. And the one thing they were doing was they were monitoring for when their customer champions left the company that they were currently at Mm -hmm. and moved to a new company, they would send them like a set of Bose headsets and something else and say like, Hey, congrats on the new role. Um, Like we're here when you need us, we're waiting for you thing. And like, I found that really interesting. And I think, geez, how can you send somebody a Bose headset? It's three, four hundred dollars a set. But when you think about the contract size, like starting at 50, 60 K as like a way to try and keep them that relationship going, even after they've left uh, the company that you're at, I thought it was really uh, clever and a unique way as well to maintain that relationship. Are you seeing any other interesting things customers doing with your product? Yeah, we see a lot of, uh, Interesting things on the sales side too, to attract customers through prospecting techniques um, to really break through just a digital noise and get on people's desks. So we find that to be a a useful technique as well. But furthermore, on the customer side, there's interesting things you can do around timing when the renewal's coming or really trying to expand your champions at the company too. I think sometimes a turn can come from just having a single threaded point of contact and so sending things to broader audiences. Now, this also worked really well when people were back in the office too, where you'd send like a group gift. And so people would be like, oh, who sent the cupcakes? And then, oh, Sendoso did or whatever our customer did. And it opened up a conversation about who sent that. What it is. Yeah, I like that. Actually, it's really interesting as a way to just to get more coverage at the office. Yeah, it's like, uh, a, it's like brand awareness almost. And then people start asking questions and then it's, oh yeah, we use this you know, vendor for XYZ. And then now you've got more coverage. Absolutely. And definitely talking through the show, enabling and expanding the number of customer champions you have within your organization is a fantastic way to protect and guard yourself against general attention. Because like you say, if you have a single point of entry and that person decides to leave, like you're pretty much uh, sort of like hoping on hanging on threads that somebody somewhere else in the organization sees value in your product or service. So. Exactly. And there's other creative ways too. Like if you're hosting like lunch and learns or even wanting to do like, we we saw some demos and donuts, which was a way for to expand more people seeing the, the product. And so for both of those, if you do need to facilitate sending lunch or if it's a digital lunch and you just want to send Uber Eats or, or DoorDash gift cards, Again, it's another way to have a a campaign that you can drive people to have a lunch and learn that's for a specific account where you're expanding the number of people you're talking to. But then with Sendosa, you can just, with a click of a button, send out 10 DoorDash gift cards and boom, you can fulfill that promise, but also get more champions at that account. Nice. Yeah. I I was thinking about this actually, like a few weeks ago, we're discussing uh, with somebody who's like now in a remote world, when you want to organize maybe like a team lunch, it's not really straightforward, especially if you want everybody to like eat at the same time and be able to order. So I think I did come across like one or two startups, like eat pizza or something like that. It was like order pizza. It was just like a click of a button. You can order pizza for your team and Mm -hmm. it came around or some similar concept, but I found it a really interesting sort of this notion as well as like how you can bring people together around a central time and be able in a remote world to do. I'm not sure to eat pizza as well. If it is, I'll find it, but I just found it really, really interesting. Let's talk a little bit about how you got to where you are today. So you started out in sales and maybe talk us through that journey a little bit. So you mentioned like a talk desk, this was a frustration where I wasn't there click point but when it comes to churn and retention like what are some of the effective ways you've seen sales done to help reduce uh, churn yeah thinking about a couple of things that I, that I used to do or that were ingrained in my head one is making sure you're selling good deals into the right ICP I think a lot of people will buy your software and sometimes early startups they'll sell to anybody but if you're more disciplined to making sure that you're selling good deals and that I think that's a way it's semi counterintuitive to a salesperson though, because AEs just want to close deals and they want to hit their quota. But if you can sell to the right ICP and make sure that it's a good deal and for each different company, they can probably spot what's a good deal or what's a bad deal. But if they can, uh, if you can spot, uh, if you can understand that, I think that's important. Another thing would be maybe spiffing on multi-year deals. I think if you give yourself more time to build that customer's trust over two, three years, you then reduce the chance that they'll churn 
because they came after one year. So I think creating spiffs around multi-year, I think finding the executive sponsors early in the process. So not waiting for the CSM or the account manager to go uh, spot more executive buyers, but as part of the sales process, you're identifying those. And even what some of the things we do now is at my company, we get, we do a lot of exec to exec engagement. And if there is a churn opportunity, our executives are already introduced to the, our customers' executives. So there's more uh, chances of uh, up-leveling the conversation from then maybe just a single champion or, or a, a buyer that's lower down that wants to churn too. Makes sense. You started out the first point with the ICP, the ideal customer profile and selling it to, and I think this is, it is key. And, and like you say, early stage, you just want to sell to everybody and just trying to get in, but it's hard to be disciplined. How have you seen sales teams effectively organize around this and ensure that you are actually selling to your ideal customer profile and not just closing deals for the sake of closing deals? Yeah. So one of the things you have to do is really look back at the data. So it's hard to do day zero because it's like you want to day 100, day 300, you can start to look at certain uh, trends. So here's the hundred customers that we sold in the last three months. Okay. Let's enrich them. So we see their industry, their company size, their use case there. And so now you get all these other data points and then you can see, okay, 10 customers are having low usage or looking like they're in a you know, red or yellow likelihood to churn, like why? And so maybe then you spot things like, okay, they are this size of company or, hey, this industry or this use case, or maybe they, this type of title bought when we usually sell to this title or they're not you. So basically it's a little bit, it's a little bit harder to just have a, again, a golden bullet to decide what it is or a silver bullet. But the approach is that you should be data-driven into analyzing your customer in after you've sold to them. And then you can spot anomalies thereafter and try to identify why uh, those anomalies are happening. And then go back to your outbound process to try to eliminate some of those things that you're selling into. No, so it's like constant iteration, like you're saying, having a good understanding of like how the sales process went, how you're acquiring them and then learning from there. The next thing I was actually intrigued as well now saying and asking the question was like at Sendoso, you're introducing, I wouldn't say maybe a, a new concept, but maybe done in a slightly new way as well. And there might be other competitors in the market, but starting out the business, like how did you go out uh, and your first distribution strategy, like as a salesman, was it uh, outbound sales? Like how did you launch the company to begin with? Yeah. So the, the two things we focused on early on was one, so me and my co-founder were both previously in sales. So we just hit the ground running, cold calling, cold emailing, sendosoing. And so we would just outbound and that was really effective. We probably got our first 50 customers like in the first couple months because we just knew how to outbound. We knew how to build target lists. We knew how to set up sequences. We knew how to set demos and close deals. So we just did that ourselves really well. We then quickly hired AEs and SDRs. Our first SDRs were probably within our first eight employees. So we really knew that we had product market fit. I think that was obvious for us, but we wanted to understand if we had really what I'd call a go-to-market fit and the unit economics and the, the CAC and LTV and, and being able to support an outbound team in, and scale that engine. So then we quickly wanted to see, okay, can these SDRs hit their metrics? Can these AEs hit their metrics? And so we, that was a, a really important goal in the early days. And then we also invested early in kind of brand and some of marketing channels that you probably wouldn't have expected. Like we would show up at conferences very early on and we'd actually bring our whole company, which was like 10 people to the booth and even like our CSM, even like a designer. And we looked bigger than we were because other people had three salespeople at the booth. We just had 10 people. It happened to be our whole company, but we invested in areas where people, we wanted to get our name out there and we sitting in a booth next to a Salesforce or a Marketo and we've got a lot of people and people start to say, Hey, this is a MarTech tool or a sales tech tool I need to. It's very interesting. Inflating yourself to look bigger than you actually are, but nice. You mentioned something as well that caught the attention is in the sense, and we actually recently hosted Christoph Jans on the show as well from Point Nine Capital. And he has a very blog post that he wrote originally is five ways uh, to hundred, to build a hundred million dollar business. And it's either like you're hunting elephants, you're hunting flies, and that he revised it, I think, at some point. But you mentioned as well now yourself, like you knew that there was pull in the market, but you wanted to understand, did you have go-to-market fits and mm -hmm. could you support a sales strategy? So like outbound sales strategy. Maybe talk us through this a little bit more in specific detail. So how 
uh, where you're going about testing this? How are you going about measuring and understanding? Could you support this model? And how did you end up saying, okay, yes, it works? Yeah. So I think having founders sell is not a real, is not real proof that you have product market fit because founders are so passionate. They can sell anything to anyone, in my opinion. And so we really needed to have outsiders who had no, no vested interest or a, a, a very smaller vested interest to see how they could sell. And so that's where we wanted to hire a fully paid SDR and two or two fully paid SDRs and two fully paid AEs. And the goal with two at the same time was that we wanted to eliminate bias of one person being just a bad um, employee or just being a bad apple. So we, we thought two people, it also gives a little bit more competition and sales is competition. And so then we set out to say, Hey, okay, here's how many target accounts you get SDRs. And here's how many meetings we need you to set. And we did the back end. You set this many meetings and you get this many accounts. You can hit this quota. And we really just did that backwards napkin math on hitting quota, uh, paying an, an OTE that actually was favorable to, to both rep the, and the SDR. And then we said, and it, w- it was really just seeing if we could back into the, the math that we know we needed if we wanted to have 50 SDRs and 50 AEs. And to scale it from there. Uh... Mm-hmm. Very cool. And then just trying to understand a little bit of what like the payback period is, what the cost to acquire customer is, and then evaluating uh, essentially from there. Because I think with a sales model, you have a lot of upfront costs when it comes to sales and understanding like, is the business come out the back end? Is the LTV going to be able to support that it is important. And so, and I think this is where obviously then churn and retention plays a big driver as well uh, in understanding, can you support it? So talking about that trend and retention then as well, the company now, if I remember correctly, is about six, seven years old. We're about f- uh, four and a half years old. So we got started in 20... very bad. Yeah, 2016. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 2016 is when I had the idea. 2017 is when uh, we actually built our first product. And then really 2018 was when we first went to market. We had a, a, a substantial price change too from 2017 to 2018, where we were really testing the market and then really went to market strong in 2018. Okay. And through that time, like, how have you seen churn and retention for yourself as well? Obviously, you provide services that help uh, create delightful experiences, which ultimately helps customers uh, stick around longer. But how's it been for you? Yeah. yeah. So I would say we, there's been some ups and downs. I'd say we right now we're at a really good place with uh, retention. And so our net dollar retention, depending on the segment. So we look at enterprise, mid market, and SMB, but our mid market and enterprise segments are well over a hundred percent, close to 120%. And the uh, overall churn is something that we're really satisfied with. I would say a couple of years ago, we had some speed bumps. And so I'm um, happy to get into those details and share how we grew past those speed bumps. And for context, we were about 450 employees. About two years ago, we were about 150 employees. And then a year before that, we were about 50 employees. So we've seen some good employee growth along with our revenue growth. And we're about, and we're about mid twenties or high twenties in uh, SaaS era too, high 20 millions. Nice. Let's talk about the speed bumps and yeah, thanks. Let's talk about the speed bumps. That's what you're talking about. So what's been the biggest speed bump to get over? Yeah. So I would, everything feels big. So maybe I'll just say a few of them and you'll determine which one was the biggest. Uh, So the first one was probably about two and a half or two years ago. We really had our CSM own all post customer function. So they owned onboarding, they owned the integration, they owned the renewal expansion, and they owned what we call like the project management piece. And at the time we thought that was worth it because it gave a single touch point for the customer. And what we really realized is that they were not good at everything. So they were good at nothing. And so it was causing this problem where our customers were being really helped along their customer journey in an effective way. And so we analyzed that and we looked at, okay, what if we strip out an onboarding team that helps customers get time to value down and get there. And for us, that was time to first send on the platform. So how do, if we have a team that onboards, trains you really quickly, then we can get that metric down and that contributes to churn. We then said, Hey, if we have a dedicated solution architect, we could then integrate and and have these integration conversations earlier and better and as part of the onboarding. So what if we had a solution architect? Then we said, hey, if we have an account manager, the CSM can focus just on training and on usage and adoption and not on, 
hey, pay us more money or, hey, let's upsell, upsell you, that account manager can do that. And then we said, hey, if we can get the, if we can have these send curators, which we call them, give all these ideas and go and actually source and, and find products and gift ideas for our customers, then the CSMs don't have to focus on that either. And so it, it might sound like there's a lot of people, uh, a lot of cooks in the kitchen there, but it works out perfectly now because now we have, depending on the account, three, four, five people that will work with customers uh, to make them more successful. And so we went from very general CSM function to very specific functions to help customers be successful at different points in their journey. And that was a huge win for a couple of years ago. And we saw a, a ton of uh, tailwind success in that. For sure. It sounds like a big shift as well in the customer success org at the company. How, so you mentioned like originally, like just having one point of contact for the customer. So how did you manage this then going forward? Because now the customer went from having one point of contact and then to five, six, potentially. What does the makeup look like there? How is like the team communicating? How are they ensuring that the client's actually being serviced when if you think there's five people, potentially they can do it? Uh, yeah, some so, point, so. so we call it an account team and the CSM is still the main point of contact. They'll just bring in other points of contact. So the CSM still sits on the first onboarding call, but we have the onboarding specialist get them up and running quick and help them with the training with, with everything there. So it's like basically gets tag teamed. We then also, for the sake of a, you know, a project where they want to come up with something new to send out, the CSM will likely be on the call too, but we'll also have a send curator that's saying, hey, I've helped these 50 other customers. Here's the send ideas. Here's what I think you should be doing. And so they're tag teaming it together there. So I think it's uh, more uh, less about, okay, now who do I reach out to? There's five people. It's, I can always reach out to my CSM, but they're going to bring in maybe another specialist that's going to help me be more successful specifically. Makes sense. So for customer, the experience is pretty much the same from a single point of contact, but then they're bringing in different uh, team members at different aspects of the user's journey. And yeah. there's obviously something we hear a lot on the show and the makeup as well is fairly similar. And it is a certain time and scale where this starts to make sense and then you start to break out the functions. Uh, Correct. And I think so that the learning there for others is just know when the time is right to do that. I think if you do it too early, you might increase your burn too much because you're having more employees than you need. But if you do it too late, your customers are going to feel the pain of not being serviced correctly. So I think for us, we did this at about a hundred employees or so we started to break out these functions. Yeah. Um, and that was something that was really helpful. For me. Yeah. So you're going to say something. Oh, no, I was going to, I could get into some other things. That, yeah, yeah, uh, I was going to say, what's next? Uh, I think team structure, yeah. CSM breaking out. Yeah, so person. number one is breaking out the CSM team structure. Um, number two, what we did is we really broke out our enterprise product from our SMB product. And so what we really realized was the SMB product or the SMB segment was churning more than the enterprise was. <clears throat> and that was something that is, I think, sometimes obvious, uh, that's, typical in most companies. But what we really did when we dove into the details was there's, we'd looked at interviews where so we were building for a thousand person sales team and these advanced roles and permission, these team functionalities, these robust reportings and a 50 person company or a 30 person company that was more than they, it, that was overly unnecessary features that would actually drive them away from the platform because it was too confusing for them. And so I think some companies choose to just focus on one segment. We're only going to sell the enterprise so we can avoid that problem. I think some companies are open to selling to multiple segments, which was something that we wanted to support because we knew there was a long tail SMB, but we also knew we wanted to support and we have probably three or 400 public companies using us that are multi thousands. We have some, you know, multi hundred thousand companies using us. And so what we had to do is really pull out what we thought was going to be needed for the SMB and what features they would care about and still build for the enterprise and still tack on all these features. And in doing so, we created a much more self-service, less feature-focused SMB starter tool or starter plan. And that really helped with uh, retention and, and tracking events through Amplitude and these cohorts and seeing what features they were using and then 
uh, really understanding that, hey, this isn't needed. An SMB is not going to create like a custom role and permission set. And so when you see that feature on the Teams page and you have to do that first in order to create a team, and maybe you don't create a team if you're a, uh, on a plan because you're, it's, so anyway, it, maybe it's obvious, uh, but when you're in the weeds and you have only a single product, you don't think about servicing two customers differently. But that was something that we analyzed the data and said, okay, let's service these two segments differently and let's break out our product team to focus on different features within the product for these different features. And then that really entailed really rolling out launch darkly and really having to get really good at feature flagging and building the same app, but for different users with different features turned on, which was more difficult from an engineering and product perspective, but from a retention perspective, I think a lot of times re- people think CSMs are the key to retention, but actually product Um, is the key to retention at times too. And so how does product thinking about it? And so we really have our product teams and our CSM teams work together when they want to improve retention. Yeah. And then sometimes it's sales, sometimes it's marketing, but yeah, it's really everyone, but um, yeah. I really like this as well. And I'm I'm trying to think as well, there's a specific bias that we have uh, when it comes to having too many features available can also be a reason for churn and not because it makes things complicated, but more because if there's too many things and people don't take advantage of them, they feel that they're not using the full service mm-hmm. so that they end up churning as a result. And I, I like this, like it serves two needs. Like obviously the one you, may, you mentioned is just making it really simple for SMBs, but on the same time, it's also like only showing them what they're paying for and only making sure that they're using what they get uh, at the yes. end of the day. So it's like reduces that anxiety that you might get from using another product where you think, oh, we're paying all this money and these are all the features, but we're only using two or three of them. Uh, where you would have paid probably that same money just for those two or three features in there because they were solving your pain uh, or your problem. That leaves me. Cool. What's number three? Let's say we have to have three. Yeah. Um, so another, um, I, I probably could, I probably have a couple more so I could come up with five if we want to, but if we don't have enough time. So the third one, this was just a small win, but we hired on a, a CX ops person and we call it CX because it looks across uh, everything post customer success, but you could think about it as CSM ops. Yeah. This is an obvious one. You invest, I feel like as, as founders or as CEOs, you invest early in like sales ops and, and marketing ops is right out the gate. CSM ops was something that was a semi afterthought for us. And looking back on it, it was, what the heck were we thinking? Why wouldn't we want to have someone that's data focused, that's running reports, that's uh, analyzing, that's helping with tools and enablement for just the CSM or, or CX org. And so when we hired that person, we instantly had someone else that was deeply caring day to day about the data sets, the tooling, the projections. And so that was a very helpful addition to the CS org. I think, yeah, CS ops or CX ops, like as you call it, is something as well. I've actually noticed a little bit more in discussion through the podcast and seeing more and more of the of it. So I think recent episodes were well with Jeff Heckler uh, from Pipedrive and just talking to his sort of like, how he saw CS or CX ops is like really the backbone that enables the rest of the team to do what they do and to scale uh, their operations effectively. Because a lot of times, like in their case, they're dealing with a large audience of SMBs. And in order to be able to service a, a large audience like that and to be able to give them like a personal touch, you need to have a solid foundation and you need to have that infrastructure, have the data available for the teams to be able to prioritize, make decisions. And how did you see that contributing to general retention? Like what was the biggest benefits that you got from having a solid ops team in place? Yeah, so it really uh, provided a more data-driven approach in terms of analyzing data, spotting data anomaly. We had someone that could help invest in tools. So we rolled out a tool called Catalyst from on the, the CSM side. And so that person was helpful in, in that rollout um, which is and en- ended up helping um, reduce churn because we had a, a better kind of infrastructure tool that worked to help the CSMs be more successful. And it also just created another champion for uh, churn in the sense of, or champion for retention, that someone that cared about those metrics and wanted to influence them to go the right way. Yeah, very nice. So you mentioned three things now, and I think None of these are really, all of them, I think, require considerable effort, considerable alignment to get the team in shape to make these changes. One of the questions I ask on the show a lot, and it's actually a terrible question in retrospect, but I'm going to ask it anyway today again. (laughs) Okay. Um, 
let's imagine a hypothetical scenario now that you join a new company and churn retention is not doing good at this company. And the CEO comes to you and says, hey, Chris, we really need to turn things around. We need to do it fast. We have 90 days and you're in charge. What are you going to do? But you're not going to pick, you're not going to say, I'm going to speak to customers and pick the problem. You're just going to run with something you've seen that's been really effective in your past and hope that it's going to work at this new company. What would be one thing that you would try to pick to reduce churn and retention fast? That's a great question. I guess all things considered, I, I might invest in like a, a customer success platform if they don't have one already, like a catalyst and try to roll, roll out something that can operationalize the success of the, the CSM team at scale, making it easier to communicate, making it easier to see the data insights, making it easier to build playbooks. So I'd say if, if that wasn't in place, I would instantly put that in place. Which, would, which could take maybe a, a month or so. And then I could instantly then build on that as the foundational piece. To push for it. Nice. Yeah, it, it's a trick question, I think, in the sense, because general attention, like everything does take a lot longer. It's not Yeah, it's, it's a just, tough question too, yeah, because you then don't want to analyze it over the, the couple of quarters, but it's one of those good gun to your head, what would you do type well, questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and maybe that's a better way for me to phrase it as well. The next question I want to know is what's one thing that you know today about churn and retention that you wish you knew when you got started with your career? I'd say like maybe when I got started with Sendoso is really just investing in like Amplitude or Mixpanel or one of these data say, usage segmenting tools or, or catalysts very early on. I think we, we, from a churn perspective, cared more about revenue up front and was more focused on let's close more deals then let's like analyze existing deals or analyze existing customer usage to see what what's working and what's not working. We just poured more fuel on the top of the funnel. And so I think it's equally important to think about churn day one as it is revenue. I think that some people are like, if I don't have revenue, I can't continue. But if you have bad revenue, it's even worse yeah, than no revenue. So I think that some people are, I just want to get to my first million dollars in sales as a founder. And it's, why are you thinking that? What, what if that million dollars is churning at a, a rate that's, that's unscalable? Like then at that million dollars isn't even worth it. So I think it's more of, you should less be celebrating revenue milestones, less be celebrating fundraising milestones and more celebrating customer attention milestones. Absolutely. And in doing so, you need to then track that data. And I think if you ask most founders in the early days, they, they don't care about that as much. Yeah. It, when you said it in my mind is all well, almost so like tech crunch headlines, or whatever. Sendosa hits net negative churn. Like, exactly. Like how many times do you hear that? Not enough. Yeah, you don't hear it enough. But yeah, I absolutely hundred percent agree with you. This is all that matters in a subscription business really is that you're retaining customers because that's the whole premise of having a subscription. So yeah, celebrating that more as opposed to the actual specific numbers. So once you get a really sticky product, then the numbers just keep coming. Like that's the beauty about it, the predictability about it. Exactly. Cool. We're coming up to the end of the show now. Is there any sort of final thoughts or like anything that you really feel we should be sharing with the listeners? Like how can they keep up to speed with your work? Anything interesting that they should be aware of? Yeah, I personally love connecting with people. So if you want to go deeper on one of these topics or, or get into the weeds on one of the ways of that I just solved churn or, or we, I think about it, feel free to email me. My email is chris, K-R-I-S at sendoso.com. Get at it in the show notes. You could find me on LinkedIn as well, um, but would love to continue the conversation and, and go deeper on some of these topics if anyone's listening and wants to talk more. Awesome. Yeah, well, Chris, thank you so much. And definitely we'll add that all in the show notes. Uh, we'll add Sendosa as well if you want to check uh, them out too. And really appreciate your time today. It's been great connecting and chatting. And maybe we'll have to have you on again to hear the, the three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, different things that you've tried as well along the way. But thanks for joining today. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. And that's a wrap for the show today with me, Andrew Michael. I really hope you enjoyed it and you're able to pull out something valuable for your business. To keep up to date with Churn.fm and be notified about new episodes, blog posts, and more, subscribe to our mailing list by visiting churn.fm. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you have any feedback, good or bad, I would love to hear from you. And you can provide your blunt, direct feedback by sending it to andrew at churn.fm. Lastly, but most importantly, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it and leave a review. 
as it really helps get the word out and grow the community. Thanks again for listening. See you again next week.